When people think sequels in Pokemon, chances are the first thing that will come to people's minds is the critically acclaimed second generation of the games. However, this isn't the only time Pokemon incorporated a full-on sequel into their main series games. Pokemon Black and White 2 were a bit of a surprise to a lot of the fans. It was a bit odd knowing that the game that we all anticipated to be Pokemon Grey turned out to actually just be a full-on sequel to the very story-driven Black and White games. One of the biggest parts of Black 2 and White 2's story is actually the quarrel between the original Team Plasma, now led by N, and Neo Team Plasma, which is led by Getsis. The battling themes between the two are some of my favorite battle themes in the entire franchise, but funnily enough, no matter how hard I looked on the internet, I could not find any form of notation of the Neo Team Plasma theme anywhere. So while it was incredibly difficult for me, I notated it to the best of my ability, and wanted to talk about some of the things that I noticed while arranging it. And uh, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's get right into it. Starting right off the bat, we've got a lot going on here in these first few measures. But the big thing here is actually what's happening before the first measure. Notice how there's a quick hit of the crash cymbal and snare drum and kick drum just before the actual song begins. This here is otherwise known as an anacrusis which is at least one or more notes that are played before the first measure of a piece. In terms of a key signature, the key is C minor. Now, a key signature is an incredibly important aspect to a piece. Located in between the clef signature and the time signature, it basically tells us what notes need to be played differently. So notice how this piece has three notes with a flat symbol, B flat, E flat, and A flat. This means that whenever we see these notes throughout the piece, we're going to play it flat unless we're told otherwise. We're able to tell that a note is flat by seeing that odd looking italicized B. These notes are slightly lower than the initial tone. And incidentally, we can tell when a note is sharped by seeing a little hashtag or number symbol or tic-tac-toe board next to a note, whatever you wanna call it. These notes are slightly higher than the initial tone. Now, when it comes to understanding what sharps and flats do, I like to tell my students to think about it kind of like using a pencil. The more we use the pencil, the more lead we're going to use up, which results in a lower and flatter tip. And when this happens, we need to sharpen it, which gives us a sharper point and brings the tip back up. Now, getting back on track, you might be wondering to yourself, why is it C minor? Why can't it be E flat major? Don't they have the same signatures? And Differentiating between a major and minor scale really revolves around the context clues. Looking at a key signature alone, yeah, it's not very easy to figure out which key you're in. But in my Persona 5 video, I mentioned that Gentle Madman was in the key of G minor because we had a octave G in the bass. Now that's the note that feels the most at home in that kind of piece. It has the most resolution to it. In this piece, C feels the most resolute and at home. If you don't have any obvious clues to tell you which key you're in, give the piece a listen and try to figure out what note sounds the most comfortable to you. This note is referred to as the tonic, which in a scale is the first and eighth scale degree. One of the things that might be jumping out to you as well is the large amount <laughs> of F sharps right at the very beginning. Now, it's showing up in both parts of the piano, and it's also being played as an octave in the bass line. This is obviously a weird thing to see, since we're in a key signature with some flats in it, but what we actually have here is what's referred to as a tritone, otherwise known as the devil in music. A tritone is an interval of either an augmented fourth or diminished fifth. And it typically gives off this incredibly uneasy feeling when played, but I love how it's used here. The use of it really adds to the overall intensity at the start of a battle. Give the beginning of the piece a listen real quick. Notice how it kind of sounds like an alarm or a siren. It really leaves this unsettling feeling when the battle starts up. Intervals come with varying distances. However, the main ones that you learn in a typical music theory class go from a first interval to an eighth interval. The distance between the notes is actually incredibly important in this instance. Intervals are often split into two different groups, 
the major minor group, and the perfect group. Intervals in the major minor group have four different tonalities, major and minor, obviously, augmented, and diminished. These intervals include the second, third, sixth, and seventh intervals. However, perfect intervals only have three tonalities, perfect, augmented, and diminished. These apply to the first, yes they exist, fourth, fifth, and eighth intervals. When we augment a note, we're raising the top note in the interval a half step higher than what's normally in the key. So for example, if we wanted to augment the interval C to F, we would need to raise the F up to an F sharp. But this is very similar to diminishing a note, however, it's more circumstantial. If we wanted to diminish a major or minor interval, you need to drop the top note down two half steps from what's normally in the key. So, for example, if we have C to A, dropping that A down two half steps leaves us with A double flat, since we have to drop the A down to A flat, and then A flat down to A double flat. We do this because dropping the top note down one half step would give us C to A flat, which is a minor interval. But if you're working with a perfect interval in this case, you only need to drop the top note down one half step. Now, the more astute of you might have realized that A double flat sounds an awful lot like G, and that is an excellent observation. This involves something known as enharmonics when two notes sound the same, but are spelt differently. Now, what do I mean by being spelt differently? Well, when we're looking at a piece of music, the notes on the staff are considered being spelt. This is actually really important to remember, because while A double flat and G technically are the same note sound-wise, they are two completely different notes because they are spelt or located differently on the staff. So the interval of C to A double flat will sound exactly like a perfect fifth. But if you're looking at it on a piece of sheet music, this would be considered a diminished sixth. But you might be wondering to yourself, how do I even figure out the tonality of an interval? Well, it's not as difficult as you think. In order to figure out whether it's major, minor, perfect, augmented, or diminished, we need to act as if the bottom note is the initial key of the piece. So let's say that we have an interval of B flat to A flat. In order to find out what our interval is, we need to act as if we're in the key of B flat, since that is our bottom note. If we look at the B flat major scale, we have B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, and B flat. So if we had B flat going to any of those notes, we would have a major or perfect interval. However, our interval right here is B flat to A flat. And A flat is not in the key of B flat. It's a half step lower than what we would normally see in a B flat major scale. By going down one half step, we have ourselves a minor seventh since B flat to A is seven notes away. If we had B flat to A double flat, it would be a diminished seventh. B flat to A natural would be a major seventh, and B flat to A sharp would be an augmented seventh. Now, hands down, one of my favorite things about this piece is actually the overall dark tonality that it has. Going through black and white one, Team Plasma was kind of, they, they were kind of weird. I never really saw too big of an issue with them. They were ideally just, you know, a cult announcing their views on how Pokemon should not be used for battle. Now, while N does eventually summon Zekrom or Reshiram, depending on what game you're playing, it isn't really until you battle Getsis, Team Plasma's leader, that you realize the severity of his ways. His overall goal was to be the only one who had captured and controlled Pokemon so that he could use them to conquer the world. And that's what I think makes the Neo Team Plasma theme that much more antagonistic and serious. We as the player know what Getsis is capable of and how dangerous he can truly be. So to make the new battle theme darker and more serious is a great choice to make. Give the music to the original Team Plasma a listen and then listen to the new Team Plasma theme.
I don't know if you guys hear the same thing, but I always thought that while the original Team Plasma theme sounds still kind of serious, it starts off very dorky, if that makes any sense. Something that does happen a bit, actually, throughout the piece is the changing of the key signature. Now, when we change our key signature, there are two actions that we can use. When we decide to play a song in a completely different key from the get-go, this is known as transposing. So, an example of this would be playing the song in E minor from the beginning instead of E flat minor, or C sharp minor instead of C minor. However, what we actually have going on in this piece is known as modulation. Modulation happens when a piece changes keys mid-song. So if we look at measure 19, we actually end up losing the E flat and A flat in our key signature, leaving us with just a singular B flat. Now in this instance, we're in the key of D minor. We also modulate at measure 43. This time, we've completely gotten rid of all the flats in our key signature, and we now have one single sharp, F sharp in this case which actually tells us that we're in the key of E minor. Listen to the modulations and notice how the tonalities actually change with the music. It really adds more color to it. One thing that you might have noticed actually are these dotted lines with an eight either above or below the line. These are referred to as octavas, which tell you to basically play something an octave higher or lower than what's actually written. Now, these are something that I feel should be implemented much more in music because basically it tells you to play a note in a higher octave or a lower octave without the dreaded use of ledger lines. Now, what are ledger lines? Ledger lines are basically lines that are implemented when we run out of space on a staff. So if a note starts to go higher and higher and higher or lower and lower and lower on a staff, we need some kind of line to tell us what that note is. And the lower or higher a note goes, the more difficult it's going to be to figure out what exactly the note is. So this is where the octavas really come into play. Hopefully you guys learned a few things from this video. If you did, be sure to hit that like button down below, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more, and comment what you thought about the video. Also, if you have any ideas on future videos that you'd like for me to do, leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear them. If you guys would like to hear my full arrangement of the Neo Team Plasma theme, I'll leave my link to my MuseScore page in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.